Okay, the next talk is uh, from Enrico Herman about logarithmic forms and differential equation for Feynman integrals. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to join all the other speakers to thank uh, Pier Paolo and the rest of the organizers for putting together such a wonderful workshop. And I think I really learned a lot over the last three days. And I ate a lot of good food in Italy. So that was, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, I'm going to talk about some uh, recent work that I've been doing together with a fantastic graduate student at UCLA with Julio Para Martinez. And uh, my motivation is probably a little different from a lot of people here in the audience, uh, in the sense that I'm coming more from the physics side, in the sense of uh, scattering amplitudes in a very special toy theory in N equals 4 super young Mills theory. Um, and uh, so I put up a couple of references for background references uh, for people who are interested in uh, that have to do with uh, some of these pictures that are on my slide with, that are related to Grassmannians and positive geometries that I don't have much time to talk about at all in this talk. But if you're interested, you can look up at some of these ref references up there. Um, so this is a workshop uh, mostly related to uh, Feynman integrals. But before coming to Feynman integrals, let me give you like a little bit of, uh, of, of some of the motivation why I'm interested in, these, uh, in, in the question that I'm trying to answer here, with this relation between logarithmic forms and differential equations for Feynman integrals. So we've seen over the, well, basically a long, long time, but uh, very prominently in the last couple of years, and uh, also the goal of this workshop is that there's a, well, scattering amplitudes are a fascinating playground uh, to look for interplay between mathematics and physics. Um, so I, well, where I'm coming from, from this uh, N equals 4 super young Mills world, there's uh, been some uh, recent developments over the last maybe six, seven, eight years or so that uh, even before you do this integration, even, do, even before you do this uh, Feynman loop integration, there are some other novel geometric structures that seem to be appearing in this, uh, in, in, this, in this theory. And that is related to uh, what is called the positive Grassmannian and something that uh, Nima Akhani Hamed and Yaroslav Tranka have termed the amplitohedron. So there's some geometric object. I will not define what the geometric object is, but there's like some underlying geometry uh, that, uh, that is in the background of, uh, of the scattering amplitudes. And uh, I think that led, led to a very fruitful collaboration uh, between physicists and mathematicians there as well. But one common theme that is uh, tied with these uh, geometric ideas is uh, that associated to these geometries, uh, there are canonical differential forms. And the differential forms you get from these geometries are these d-log forms. So that's what my motivation is for studying these type of d-log d -log forms. But uh, so this is a conference about uh, Feynman integrals. It turns out that these d log forms that you get from this Grassmannian and from these geometric ideas and scattering amplitudes, uh, these d log forms you can find a new representation that hasn't appeared here in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, conference. There's there's a new representation of Feynman integrals, not in terms of Feynman parameter integrals or Bykov integrals that we've seen in the past uh, in the past three days or so. But uh, well, Johannes showed and on the first in his talk on the first day that uh, there's this new representation in terms of these d-log forms associated to an Feynman integral to a Feynman integrand there is a differential form which you can write as d-log forms and I, I'll, I'll explain a little more of what what exactly that means oops wrong way okay so kind of the outline is uh, I want to talk about the d log forms of Feynman integrals. It's uh, not at all obvious like how you get these d log forms of Feynman integrals. And uh, as I said, uh, we are probably much more used to more traditional forms in terms of Bykov representations or uh, Feynman, parameter uh, Feynman parameter representations. So and then, uh, so there's a theoretical interest of these d-log forms for physicists. That uh, well, I told you about the special theory n equals four super young Mills and these all these nice geometric ideas. So a natural question would be: Does any of these uh, of these geometric ideas extend uh, to more general quantum field theory? So that's something physicists would be interested in. That I'm interested in. So from a more practical point of view, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Is like these d-log forms do something nice for you, and I'll explain to you a little bit of what what the this nice feature about these d-log forms, since that they lead you to simplified differential equations. 
Um, so all the, all the examples that I'm going to discuss in this talk, they're of course completely known, like everything has been integrated before, but I just want to give a little different perspective on uh, uh, how one could think about uh, Feynman integrals, and hopefully this will extend later on to more complicated cases where traditional methods are uh, reaching uh, their limits. Um, I'm not claiming that I have like an algorithmic way of like getting more and more complicated things yet, but at least like if we have a new way of thinking about them, maybe maybe in the future that that'll lead to more and stronger stronger algorithms to to do these Feynman integrals. Um, so and uh, as I'll explain, also there is some nice geometry associated with these Feynman integrals. Um, and uh, one one way to think about this is well, these Delock forms are quite nice as I'll explain that well a delog form is almost a primitive and so once you have the Feynman integrand in this form it just begs to be integrated. Okay. So just uh, very quickly I will not explain uh, I'll not explain the Grassmannian. Associated to these Grassmannians are these uh, bipart part bipartite graphs and on these bipartite graphs uh, they well basically they label some cell in a in a Grassmannian and associated to this uh, Grassmannian geometry is some logarithmic D log form. Um, so in very special cases, as shown in this paper here that I reference here, you can translate that form under Grassmannian directly into a, a loop, loop momentum, Feynman loop momentum space, and external kinematic space. And then that's exactly where, where we get this example, where we get this example uh, uh, of, of this box form, one loop box form in four dimensions. If you're, if you're not so interested in the Grassmannian side of things, that's fine. You can just easily, well, it's, once you have this form, it's easy to check that this, this four form here actually reproduces what you would normally write down for that integrand, namely like the D4L over the four, propagate, the four propagators that, that you're seeing. Oops. Excuse me, what is L star? Um, so L star is a special point that is associated to this geometry. So L star is the point, if you, if you set all propagators on shell, that gives you, well, there's actually two solutions to that. And L star is one, one of the solutions of setting the four propagators to zero. Sorry. Yeah. So you'll see that, actually, that's, that's a very good point. You'll see that this innocuous looking L star here is going to play a very, very important role uh, later on. So uh, yes. I'll explain a little more what this L star means. Uh, so that was, a, that was the simplest one loop example that, uh, that we had for D log forms, but uh, then uh, uh, later on uh, we extended or we now became pretty good at uh, finding these D log forms for more complicated integrals. And this is just to show that like, we have many D log forms, simple D log forms for three loop integrals, uh, integrals with internal masses, for example. So. Uh, for a certain class of integrals, for a certain class of integrals, um, there is now there are some building blocks that we have, like how to write uh, how to write pretty compact D log forms. So, um, so of course you will not be able to write D log forms for for all the integrals, especially once you have uh, elliptic integrals. You will not be it's, it will not be sufficient to have uh, only D log forms, but you also need elliptic differentials. Um, so, but for a special class of integrals where we think that, well, once you can, definitely when you get a polylogarithmic expression <laughs> for the integrated answer, or you think that you can get a polylogarithmic expression for the integrated answer, it should be possible to basically try to find the D-log form for, the, for that Feynman integral. So, if you have if you have a D-log form for a Feynman integral, it's a natural candidate to guess that uh, you might be able to find, it, it might evaluate to multiple polar rooms. And uh, so as we'll see, it's, um, well, these, uh, these uh, D-log forms, they're, they're related to what's called in the special theory, uh, to a uniform transcendentality conjecture in this N equals 4 superior mills. So one nice thing about these uh, these uh, d log integrands that you have is uh, so as Johannes explained on Monday uh, these uh, these integrands uh, the, or these integrals will be uh, are natural candidates to feed into the different in the more traditional differential equation method to bring them uh, to get a differential equation uh, system that is uh, a simplified form that's in this epsilon factorized form as Johannes explained on Monday. 
So, well, so for more for the physicists and the audiences, there is also some question about the symmetries of non-planar of non-planar integrals and non-planar amplitudes. Um, and well, we know that the logarithmic forms are associated to some positive. Well, positive geometries have associated to them uh, logarithmic forms. We find logarithmic forms for Feynman integrals, so a question, natural question to ask is: uh, Is there some geometry associated with them that give rise to these forms? So that's all open questions. I will not answer many of them. Uh, it's just uh, something to keep in mind in the background. So anyway, so we have a big class of these examples of these D-log forms. So you might ask now, so what? Um, so well, normally, uh, yeah, so what, what do you do with these D-log forms? So as I said, these D-log forms, well, you almost have the primitive. So, I mean, ideally, you would like to integrate them like directly in this format. So you have to primitive. I mean, it should be almost trivial to integrate. Uh, but what one normally does, uh, what one normally does, if you see a Feynman integral like this, you would go back, you would go back to Feynman parameter space or whatever standard method you are having to integrate them. So another question uh, you might ask is, uh, so why are, so well. It's not a proof, but like in many of the examples that uh, we've seen in physics that, w that we, we were able to, to, to calculate, is, uh, you see that uh, these L loop Feynman integrals in D equals 4 give rise to uh, transcendental functions up to weight 2L. But you have 4L, well, you have, uh, you have uh, 4L integrations to do, but the transcendental weight is 2L. So where does this like, transcendentality mismatch uh, uh, come from? Uh, and, and one other thing you might, uh, might want to you might want to learn something about these integrals from a different perspective. So, uh, so now I said many, many words. So let's look at some examples in more concrete detail. So one thing I want to start with is I want to study a special class of one-loop integrals, namely these Degon integrals, so there's D propagators, and I want to consider them in D space-time dimensions. So there's some uh, external kinematic numerator dependence here that just takes care of some normalization. And uh, so here I'm taking this, well, I, I'm writing these one loop integrals in terms of like some dual momentum space. But so I'm integrating over, I'm integrating over x, and then uh, my external kinematics is, ex is encoded in these external vectors that I label by x1 to xd. And uh, I want to talk about, I also want to have internal masses just to not have to worry about single, single IR singularities. And uh, I want to talk about those as uh, Euclidean integrals. So there should be completely well-defined uh, integrals um, uh, that are typically done in, in, in Feynman parameter space, but I want to do them in a slightly different way here. OK, so that's, that's the d gon in d dimensions is a little bit too complicated. I'm a very pedestrian uh, person, so I want to start from a pedestrian toy example to learn basically the uh, to learn the well, kind of crucial feature that will help me later on to uh, study more complicated examples. Um, so, so let's look at a baby, baby example of a of a of a one-dimensional integral uh, with some fixed uh, integration boundary, and it has I, I have some uh, uh, differential differential form. So. Um, one way to do that integral is, uh, as one learns very early on, I can find the primitive, namely the d log form, and then I just plug in the boundary values of the of the primitive. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Okay, let's let's look at it at a slightly different way. Instead of doing the integral, let me write a differential equation for that integral that depends on external parameters a and b. Uh, and the differential, of course, is given by Leibniz rule, so I get a, a, I get a contribution from the differential from the boundary term, and I get a contribution from the variation of the integrand. Again, I can, uh, I, again, so I, I put everything together to find the d-log form that I now can integrate in terms of the external, in, in terms of the external variables. All right. So there's a, well, of course, you can change variables to push basically the boundary term back into the integrand, but that's not so important. But the, the critical thing here is this, that uh, um, if you consider, if you do this change of variables and you consider this integrand, not only, at the, not only as, a, as a form on the, integration, uh, on the integration variable y, but also on the external 
together with the external parameters A and B, like if you think of this as a differential form on the full space, then uh, of course it is, this, this will be a closed form. And that allows me to do basically integration by parts. Yeah. And uh, from this integration by parts, the crucial thing is that uh, the integral localizes to the boundary. All right. Okay, so now we've done the, we've graduated from uh, our baby baby examples. Let's go go on to kindergarten, uh, where we do a two parameter, where we do a two variable uh, situation, where we have two integration variables. So for simplicity, I, I'll consider an integral that depends on one external parameter that I call a, and uh, I have to integrate. It's a two for I have to integrate some two form here. Um, so. Of course, I can. It, this this integral is completely elementary. I can go to I can go to uh, um, um, polar coordinates and do the integral. I can just uh, type it in whatever I find it in the book or whatever. Um, uh, but I I want to I, I want to think uh, I want to do this integral in a slightly more interesting way uh, that helps me to generalize uh, to Feynman integrals later on. So again, so you have here this what I would call like a rational uh, a rational form of the integrand. Um, I can you can check that you can rewrite this rational integrand as a two form as this twofold d log form. So it's always it's not so easy to find these d log forms in the first place. It's always easy once you have a d log form. It's always easy to check that this form here reproduces the rational form here by just uh, basically by, by just plugging in, uh, taking the d's of these things and wedging them together. You you can you can reproduce the rational form of the integrand. So. That, cup, that brings me back. So we, we see something very similar to what I showed for the Feynman integral point of view. So you see here, this, uh, this rational form has, bas has basically two poles. You have, a, you have a quartic here, and you have another quartic here. And you see these two poles, this one and this one, will show up as entries of the d log form. Of course, it needs to, because it needs to, the d log form needs to reproduce the singularities of, that, uh, of, 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 the, of the integrand. So the singularities show up here. It's very something very natural to what that you would expect in the in, in the differential form. But on top of that, you get these additional points here. These additional these additional uh, these additional things here that uh, correspond to this L star that uh, David was uh, uh, commenting on earlier. So that's quite that's quite something interesting. That in these d log forms, you see some new structure appearing that you naively don't see uh, in the rational form of, of, of writing it. And uh, so again here, these uh, c plus and minus and c bar plus and minus are the solutions of what I would call the maximal cut, the maximal cut equation of setting these two quadratic things, uh, setting these two quadratic things uh, to zero. It's also the Kapkowski cut for the two-point function. Well, it, let me, let me, uh, let me, uh, yes, uh, yes. So this is, at the moment, this, at the moment, this thing is not a Feynman integral. It's just some integral I, I, I consider. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll come to how that relates to Feynman integrals in one second. Yes. So, yeah, so it's, it, there's uh, some quite interesting structure. And again, like from the cuts, there's, you can think of it as like there's some ge geometric, uh, there's some geometric interpretation of these points. Okay. Okay, so we have the so we have the integral, which is uh, well, it's the integral over this uh, differential two form, and uh, I I, I want to do it as uh, in terms of these d log forms. I want to make use of this d log structure. We saw in the one variable case, once I have the primitive, once I have the d log, I'm basically done. I've done the integral. So uh, of course, in the multivariable case, and in, in the multivariable case, it's not quite as simple, but it should still help you. That it should still help us that uh, this uh, this form. This form is closed on the full space. So, um, so I want to distinguish now that uh, this form. If I think of this form on the full space of both internal and external internal and external variables, I can uh, I can d put little indices on it to, to tell me like how many of the how how many of the d's point into the internal integration direction and how many uh, point into external into this external direction that I here just label a. Um, so on the full space of both internal and external kinematics, this omega form is closed. The omega is zero, which allows me 
uh, to relate in, in a, a derivative in terms of external uh, external uh, parameters, uh, I can trade that for internal derivative with respect to one of the integration uh, uh, variables. And uh, well, so then uh, I, then I can if I if I use this identity and I take a differential of the Feynman integral, it we'll see that this has very far-reaching consequences, and that will simplify our life for the differential equations. Okay, so yeah, so the, the fact that this uh, form, this integrand form is closed, um, yes, so, uh, so exactly, so yeah, the fact that this, uh, this form is closed will help us later on, and uh, so you can write it explicitly like what this. I, so so there, there's this form, this omega one comma one, where one one of the one of the one of the these points into the integration variable along the integration variables and one into the external variables. You can find once you have this omega form. Of course, it's very trivial to to get the explicit representation of these things. And again, we see in these omega one comma one forms, then actually these special points show up. These set plus set minus uh, points show up in this in these components. And uh, the crucial fa the crucial fact about these uh, additional points that you s see here in these forms is that they actually intersect uh, they intersect the uh, integration the integration cycle, uh, which is uh, which is crucial because um, so what that means is so these these uh, these singularities here, now we have some singularity if I take the differential uh, if I take the differential of the of the integral with respect to external variables. I rewrite it using, well, I, I rewrite it, I trade the external derivative for an internal derivative, trading it for this omega 1 comma 1 form. And now I have to, to have a well-defined integral. I need to basically excise, I need to exactly excise these singular regions from the integration, from the integration cycle to make the thing well-defined. So um, that being said is, so there's these two points here that, uh, that I label by these singular points P. In order to make, and I have sigma my integration cycle, in order to make the integral well defined, I have to cut out like, some little neighborhoods around these points. Um, but then if I look at the differential of the integral, again, I use this, I use the rule that I trade the external derivative for the internal derivative. And now I can use, uh, now I can use Stokes theorem uh, but I have to modify. If I do that, I have to modify my uh, my integration cycle a little bit by by cutting out these little neighborhoods. But now I can use Stokes theorem, and what happens is that the integral actually localizes to the boundary of this of this space. Now, now the space has a little boundary, uh, exactly where I cut. Oops, where I cut out uh, this thing. So the integral localizes. The integral localizes to exactly these little red uh, red circles here. And uh, of course, these little red circles, I do a little, uh, well, basically, the integral around these little red circles become a residues around these points. So we saw from taking the differential of these d log forms, um, cutting out, uh, cutting out this, uh, this neighborhood around these singular regions, uh, localized. So one, one, one integration I get rid of from localizing by Stokes theorem. And the second integration is done because it done, it's done in a way that it becomes just a residue calculation. So I've gotten from, from taking the differential of the integral, I've gotten rid of two integrations. So this is exactly, uh, well, this is uh, the natural thing that uh, you would expect um, in the sense that um, now if I take the differential of this integral, which was a uh, which was a twofold integral, it becomes a residue calculation, and I, I'm just left with a single d log. So from two integrations, I, I dropped. Uh, so it's a d log now in only external kinematics that is related to these uh, to these special points. All right. So, uh, so secretly, as uh, David already pointed out, uh, the example that uh, the example I, I just discussed uh, in terms of uh, not not in the context of Feynman integrals was secretly a Feynman integral, and it's exactly the the bubble integral in two dimensions that I discussed. So, 
which would be more familiar for someone who has seen these d log forms in the context of Feynman integrals some more. Uh, this bubble integral in two dimensions, this is the normal propagator way of writing it. The integrand form you can write into this d log form. And uh, if, you, if you just change the variables, uh, if you take the differential of this, uh, if you take the differential of this two-loop Feynman integral, it's a d log of uh, some of these special points. So it's the propagators of the, so the d log that comes out, the result of that integral, is uh, the two propagators that you see here evaluated on some points that I denote bullet and uh, and empty, where these points are given by the solutions to these. Uh, uh, well, I used to call it L star. So, so now there are two solutions to the maximal cut. I call there's two solutions. I call this S plus and L plus and L minus. Then you get two more quadratic equations to tell you that L plus L minus L plus squared is zero and L L, L minus L minus squared is zero. So that gives you these two solutions, bullet and and and, and empty, and uh, these you plug in. So that's something. There's a lot of moving. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, <coughs> Um, there's a lot of moving parts, but um, um, yeah, so these special points are basically, so these special points that I call bullet and bullet star is uh, exactly these points. So there's, so there's four different points now in this problem. There's these L plus and L minus, which would be outside. They are kind of like complex points out, outside of the integration region. And then there are some light cones from these originating from these points that intersect that intersect with the real integration cycle and you have to cut them out so these would correspond to this l bullet and and l empty you have to cut it out and the integral localizes to exactly these points Sorry, I'm confused. Can I ask yeah yeah sure how, how is this different from just doing the differential equations right because what differential equations do they give you they trivialize your integrations except one and you get your poles right your, you That is right, yeah. But the the, nor the way you normally do differential <laughs> equations, you hit you hit your integral uh, you hit your integral with a differential of uh, external kinematics. What you get is get something with a double pole, uh, with a double propagator. Then you have to use IBP relations to shift it back, okay. and then it. All I'm saying is, from the, once you have the d log form, I never had to do IBPs. The d log form, everything like pulling out pulling out the d log, what you would call what you get what you get from the normal way of writing the differential equations, I never have to do the IPPs to shift it back. It all, it's all happens in this localization step. And maybe it becomes a little more clear once we go to a little more complicated example. So the next, well, so, the, so now that we understand the bubble integral, so that the bubble integral you're left with nothing, basically. You're localizing on, on a zero-dimensional. From a two-dimensional integral, you're localizing to a point, which is a zero-dimensional thing. So you're dropped by exactly two dimensions. Um, so this, this drop by two dimensions uh, becomes uh, uh, more clear if I now look at the box integral in, in four dimensions. And uh, the box integral in four dimensions also has a d log has a d log form to start with. Um, oops. Um, it has a d log form to start with, which is again the ratio of uh, the propag of the propagators in the problem. These are the normal the normal singularities that you would uh, you would expect in your integral. And on top of this, there's these extra these extra propagators that I would call d plus and d minus, which are which I used to call before l minus l star or l minus l plus l minus l minus squared. Um, so there's a, these these special propagators there. Um, I used the same trick as before. And uh, integrate take take the fact that the integrand on the uh, or the, the the form viewed as on the form on the full space of both internal and external kinematics is a closed form to trade the external derivative with an internal derivative. Then I can integrate by part and by Stokes theorem I localize, and I localize to a, a, I localize to a lower dimensional I localize to a lo lower dimensional surface. Um, but now I'm left with something, so I'm, lo I'm localized, once I do this residue calculation too, I'm localized to a, uh, to a co-dimension two surface, which I denote now by sigma two. But now I have a, I have a three form, and I have to integrate that three form over some two, two cycle. 
So what does that mean? Well, basically what that means is that one of these d's here does not point into the internal integration direction, but one of the, uh, one of the d's points into the external direction. So in order to make it, to, in order to really get the, the differential equation out, I want to pull out one of the d's that only points into the external, internal into the external direction, and I want to write the rest as a two form that only points into the internal direction. Well, Fortunately, there's, uh, one, uh, there's one algorithm of how you can do that. You can do partial fractioning, or for people who are more in the physics, uh, in, on the physics side, we call that generalized unitarity. So for this form, we can, we can write down an ansatz of, uh, of integrands, and then we ch we, the only thing we do is we compare residues on the left-hand side and right-hand side. So I can partial fraction that form and to pull out one of the d logs explicitly. And that actually, so, so that, that, that I can do. So again, to show this, uh, to show this, geo this geometry that uh, I had before, so we had these special points as x plus and x minus. And then, uh, so there's these special points x plus and x minus, so there's an over, and then there's like some, uh, there's this intersection, there's this intersection surface uh, between the integration region and these, uh, these additional, and these light cones spanned by these uh, additional points, which localizes the sigma 2 surface. And, uh, yeah, exactly. So then, uh, exactly, I, I, I partial fractioned, I partial fractioned the form, and what happens? The result of this partial fractioning thing, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of, I can partial fraction this, uh, this three form in terms of what are called bubble integrals in two D that we've already understood in the previous case, and then there's some d log that comes out, the d log that only points into the external direction. One uh, kind of nice feature about these d-log forms, the d-log that pulls out, so that would be exactly the, from the differential equation point of view. That's exactly the d-log you would see if you were to do normal differential equations, as, uh, as, Lorenzo, would, as Lorenzo would do. But here, the nice feature is that yeah, there's some interpretation of these d-logs in the external kinematics that they're, they're always given as ratios of propagators evaluated at certain special points that are associated uh, to the geometry of the Feynman integral. So here I call this like x star 3, 4, which is given by the, these, these stars are always given by certain cut equations. So that's kind of the nice thing. Everything, everything is given in terms of residue calculations only. So you haven't specified your kinematics. This is completely general. Uh, so this is yes. Yeah, so now I'm t ten different kinematic variables. All of this is general. right. So this is. So you have to be a little, so exactly. So here I've specified my kinematics here. Sorry, I didn't mention it explicitly. I'm taking, the, I'm taking a case where, uh, where, I don't, uh, where I don't have uh, massless external legs yet. So if you have massless external legs, you, you know very well, then this integral is divergent. So I, I'm only discussing uh, fi finite integrals right now. Yeah. But it's, well, that being said, it's completely generic. I can have uh, arbitrary internal masses and arbitrary external masses. So that's completely, that's completely generic. It's just the solutions. So that's, that's one of the nice things. So it's just like implicitly defined that way. As to, like everything in these problems are now defined as just solutions, so solutions of, these, of certain sets of quadratic equations. So of course, if you want the explicit solution in terms of like whatever Mandelstam and masses, these solutions get more and more complicated the more scales you have in the problem. But uh, implicitly defined, I mean, that's a nice thing. It's just defined by this geometry. Like these, you have to set these quadratic things to zero, and you plug it into the other propagators. So in that sense, it's, it's, very, it's very algorithmic. Um, okay, so then you keep going at one loop. You can do these degons and d dimensions, and uh, from the from this iterative structure, I mean, studied the, the the bubble case in two dimensions, the box in four dimensions, the hexagon in six dimensions. Then you kind of you figure out the you figure out the pattern, and the pattern is such that if you study these degons and d dimensions, you again have the normal propagators and these special points. There is some recursive structure that the differential of this degon an integral is uh, given by a d log times some integral times some integral in 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 two lower dimensions and uh, for i think david uh, it's uh, very obvious what this uh, 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 what this what this formula 
what this formula is or what this formula is uh, reminiscent of. It's that these uh, one loop Degon integrals are associated to volumes in hyperbolic uh, in the hyperbolic space. And this uh, differential formula that we dis that we discovered in this way from the in the context of these d log uh, d log integrands is nothing but the Schleffli's formula. And uh, there's some uh, relation to older work by Davidichev, Delboro, Aomoto, and uh, also Mark, Mark Spradlin and Anastasia Volovich. Um, yeah, so there's also other related work for these one loop integrals in the physics literature that appeared over the last couple of years by Nima Akani Hamed and again uh, Mark Spradlin and Anastasia Volovich. Oops. So let me just make a, a, a few comments on this on this one loop uh, on this one loop integrals. So we saw that the d log having these d log integrands, you almost have the primitive of of the Feynman integral. So that really helps us. The fact that the integrand is now like it's manifestly written in in a way that you can see that. Uh, it is, it is a closed, you have a closed form, helps you to do this localization via Stokes theorem and a residue ca calculation. Um, there's also some, uh, there, there's also some relation to this recently proposed diagrammatic co-action by uh, Ruth Brito, Samuel, Claude Dorr, and Einan Gardi, uh, that I don't have much time to go into now. Um, so uh, one of the key features that we've seen is that the differential of a Feynman integral in d dimensions is related to Feynman integrals in, in, in lower dimensions. And uh, you can write some very nice and compact formulas for these differential equations without having to do any IBPs. OK, so uh, uh, just in the last five minutes or so, uh, let me go on. Like one loop, OK, like I guess the experts here in the audience would say like one loop we can do for breakfast. So uh, what, can you, uh, what, what can you add to this story? Um, so one of the nice things in comparison to one of some of the older to some of the other uh, formulae that I sh referenced to here is that our method with these d-log integrands generalizes to higher loops. So uh, at higher loops, the structure is, uh, is, is, uh, is a little different in the sense that you can think of, uh, you can think of this uh, higher loop examples by integrating one loop at a time. And then you have, uh, you have a structure of the following form. You have some log so you have some logarithmic form. That is the unintegrated part of, the, uh, of, of your higher loop integral. And then on the, on the other side, you, you've integrated out. You've already know, you already know what the lower loop integral does. And it, it, uh, it is some uh, transcendental function. It is some transcendental function that you know because you know everything about lower loop. Um, so there's a toy example, again, a, a baby toy example of that form, uh, where you have a d log, a simple d log integrated against some other log. So again, instead of doing the integral, uh, instead of doing the integral uh, uh, um, elementary, uh, I want to do it in the sense that I again want to use uh, the differential equation for that for that thing uh, to do to do uh, to get some information about the integral. And uh, so if I take the differential of this integral, of course, there again, uh, I have a boundary. I have a boundary contribution of the thing, and I have a contribution of uh, of the uh, of the of the integrand from from taking the differential with respect to the integrand. So then again, I'm in a similar situation that I was before. Now well, I have a I have two d's. Uh, to, I have I have two d's. One one of them points into the external direction. One of them points into the integration direction. In order to pull out, in order to write it manifestly as an integral over this over my over my integration variable, I have to do again this partial fractioning trick, and I can easily I can easily do the partial fractioning trick. So it's always this uh, it's kind of this uh, this this multi-step process. Like first I do this do the localization. I do, first I do the localization, and then I do a partial fraction. Then I do a partial fraction step, and that will go over and over again. So, uh, so just uh, just to show one brief example that uh, what we did in, the, in in our paper was that uh, we looked at this double box integral. So it's a non well, it's a non-trivial integral. Of course, it's been known uh, since uh, since a long, long time. But uh, so there is a d log there is a d log representation for this inter there is a d log integration for this representing for this integrand, but I want a view of this two-loop integral as integrating out, let's say, the right loop first, and then writing down the differential form for the left for the left loop. So there is some four form. It's not just a box. It's some generalized version of the box. Um, 
and then this f right, I would, it's a way to transcendental function in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of dialogues and, and products of, of logarithms. Again, I take the differential. I take the differential of this two loop of of this form, and uh, so there's some special points related to this. Uh, again, there's uh, so what I can do is uh, I take the differential uh, of this two loop integral. There's a contribution where the differential hits the form. There's a contribution where the differential hits the where the differential hits hits the polylogarithmic function. But well, I know how to take differentials of polylogarithmic functions either in terms of the in terms of the co-action, the n minus one comma one uh, co-product, or just like well, taking a differential of of of, of a dilogarithm. Uh, so I can do that. So then, that what the name of the game is? I have the partial. F I have the partial fraction again. I can partial fraction this out and pull out one of the external d logs. And what I'm left with is uh, the differential equation for this two-loop integral in terms of a d log that only points into the external into the external kinematics times some weird-looking object. So that's that's uh, some kind of new new-looking object that's not so that's not so familiar from more traditional ways of doing the the differential equation. In the sense that, uh, well, there's these mixed uh, mixed dimension objects. These mixed dimension objects make kind of sense from the uh, in the context of transcendental weight, in the sense that, uh, well, normally a one loop a one loop integral in 4D is basically transcendental weight two, and a 2D integral in uh, a, a integral in 2D is a logarithm. Uh, and uh, so that adds up to a weight three. What do you would expect from from well? This should be a weight four function, and uh, you get both contributions. And uh, so yeah, so that's that's a non-trivial example that we were able to do from uh, from uh, from our D log perspective. All right. Thanks a lot. I think uh, the time is running out. Uh, I, I'm happy to answer some questions after the talk. Thanks. for the interesting talk and uh, questions. Uh, could you say a bit more about this uh, relation between what you were calling partial fractioning and the generalized unitarity cuts or what? Yeah, well, I mean, the you show that this, there is a way of doing this partial fractioning, I don't know if computing cuts or Right. I mean, well, I mean, you oh, know that partial fractioning you can do by just comparing, the, yeah, by just comparing the residues. Yes. Uh, well, that's all I'm saying. It's just okay. a different. So you, I mean, that's what you do in generalized unitarity. You write an ansatz of form, well, an ansatz of forms on the right hand on the right hand side, and then to compare to whatever you want want to represent into this new basis of forms, you just compare unitarity cuts, or basically con com comparing uh, residues. So that's all, that's all I'm saying. You know, you, know what, you know what singularities you need to have, you, because you know what type of propagators are still there, so you, you, know, you know exactly what type of objects you have to start with. And then uh, you just fix the coefficients in front of these objects, which is exactly, the, the coefficient is exactly a d-log, but the d-log now only depends on external kinematics, because the residue on the things that you localized on, it's completely localized, so everything can only have external kinematic dependence. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's. Yes. So I have a question. So suppose that the integral itself is divergent. So can you somehow try to include this kind of regulator epsilon somehow to this differential form language? Well, I mean, uh, so one way, like for, for, for me, I think the. At least for IR prop, like for IR divergent integrals, the, for me the most natural regulator would be to put some little mass or something in. So for the I, for if you if you want to go to dim rec, if you want to go to dim rec, I mean you have to do you have to I think go to route that Simon was uh, advocating for. Then so there was no twist there was no twist for me. So like everything was like strictly four dimensions. If you want to do dim dimensional reg regularization, you have to follow more this uh, you have to follow the the path of this conference and do this twist and uh, I think uh, then you'll you'll end up in the intersection theory uh, uh, world which would be I mean yeah which which would be quite interesting to work out uh, more okay thanks a lot yeah. so, 
Uh, so thank you very much. You, you, you predicted that I would enjoy your talk, and you <laughs> really did. Um, to, under to understand the double box, you're looking at the uh, massless internal particles and arbitrary external masses. That's right. Uh, but that's precisely the situation in which I showed from dual conformal invariants that, 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 that it's really the triangle, yes? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I mean, so, so it was, it was uh, uh, Andrei Davidichev and Natalia Ozukina who first came up with the quadrilogarithms for this, but yeah. they're the same as for the triangle. Yeah, so, right. so, so everything that you said analytically here right. would have been done for the triangle, uh, 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 the triangle ladder. That's yes? right, that, that's, that's right, that's right, because of exactly... Yeah, there are only two conformal cross ratios. Well, I, I was sweeping that under the rug. Like, the reason why I only have set and set bar is exactly because of dual conformal invariance yes. that allows me to, uh, like, naively I would have many more, I had F, S, T and the four masses, Okay, you can get one to the, you can factor one out for dimensional analysis for, for dimensional reasons, but then you would get and normally in the generic case you would have ended up with much more kinematic dependence. Here I've already used the fact that it's, it's exactly the conformal the conformal integral which only depends on two variables. Yeah, that's that's certainly right. Yes, we knew about dual conformal invariance before. Yeah, no, that, I mean that's that's equals four super No, that is three. actually that is actually very that's that that's that's exactly that was one of my earlier comments. And <laughs> now you can try to like once you have these like nice d log forms, you can try to study some sort of like symmetries of uh, non-planar Feynman integrals if you have a correct language uh, uh, of doing so. Yeah, thanks. All right. Any additional? Quick question. Hope not. I need to get run to the train station. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks a lot. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.